Restoring Eelgrass, next on Environment Long Island. Welcome to Environment Long Island. I am Carl Grossman, and with me is Rob Vassiluth, and he's figured out an ingenious way to restore eelgrass. And Rob, when I first moved to, to Noyak, near Sag Harbor, eelgrass was so plentiful in these East End bays. I mean, my wife and I used to, after even a minor storm, go to Long Beach in Noyak and pick up the little mountains of eelgrass and take it home and use it for, uh, oh, uh, for gardening. Uh, it, it, it was, what a, what a wonderful mulch. But these days, eelgrass, uh, uh, sea live, particularly scallops, so dependent on, on eelgrass. And these days, you go, to, you go to Long Beach in Noyak. I mean, after a big storm, and it's hard to find uh, eelgrass. And, and you figured out a way to, uh, restore, to bring back, to revive eelgrass. I have. Uh, have I fully proved that it's uh, very successful? No. Uh, it takes a year to grow. So whatever you do with eelgrass and whatever method you use to grow it, it, it's a year cycle. So if you screw it up, it takes another year to go back at it. So it's uh, not a very fast paced thing. Yeah, but it, you're an operating engineer. Correct. I mean, you have a lot of construction. Yeah. You're from Comac, a native Comac uh, person, a native Long Islander. You've become, in recent decades, a big environmentalist. And you're projecting a lot of that kind of environmental fervor, environmental interest in regard to, to eelgrass. Tell us, and then we'll get back to your uh, system for eelgrass, how you became uh, such a big environmentalist, Rob. I, uh I, I guess it, it started when I uh, w was a first responder at 9-11. I, uh, I got to see what the world looks like destroyed. You know, the city that I loved, the buildings that I loved the most were laying in rubble. And uh, it was terrible. And it's something that I still have with me to this day. But I, I wanted to save people's lives. It was something I, I really wanted to do and I wasn't able to do. And about 10 years after 9-11, I was looking around for something to save, and a little fish came my way, a little fish called alewife. And uh, I wanted to help this fish, and I, I found out that its, its population is down by 90 to 100 percent. Mm. Uh, so I did everything I can, and, and I still do. I have a narrow focus on this fish, uh, river herring. Uh, they live in the ocean, and then they, they come into uh, freshwater rivers, and then into the freshwater ponds, and they, they spawn in the exact same spot that they were hatched. And uh, I've had some uh, decent success with helping restore them. Well, the big problem with alewives, I, I know from near me is a, uh, I don't know the name of it, but a, a substantial stream, it's in North Sea, yep. but there's, you know, dams have really screwed up the alewives uh, getting back to, you know, it's, it's uh, it's kind of sad. Well, there's about 150 rivers and streams on Long Island that flow into the seawater, uh, and every one of them, except for one, has been dammed, or, uh, or culverts, which are like pipes to let water flow from one area to another. Right. Uh, so the one, one spot uh, is called Alewife Creek, and it's never been uh, dammed. And Where's it's, that? Uh, it's right near Northwest Harbor. It's, uh, it's here in the Hamptons. Right. Uh, and it's the most successful run of fish of alewife, river herring, uh, on Long Island. So uh, by removing dams or putting in fish passages, uh, we could revive millions of fish. And uh, it's a slow process. It takes years. Uh, there's a lot of naysayers out there that don't want their ponds removed and they want to keep the dams. But the dams stop uh, migrating fish. And uh, when you stop the fish from migrating, you 
lose out on those species of fish. Why do they put so many dams on so many streams? Well, they put dams for uh, mills back in the day, uh, for cranberry bogs, so mostly for mills. But we don't need them anymore, but the dams still exist. And even in some cases, they've rebuilt the dams, and they call that restoration. But it's a continued uh, uh, detriment to migrating fish. And, and these migrating fish produce, you know, uh, one female alewife makes about 250,000 eggs. Uh. Now, not all of them will hatch. Uh, not all of them will make it to maturity. You know, if we give them the, the area to spawn in that they're looking for, that they're successful in, we'll have millions more fish, which brings about, you know, the fish that everyone likes to catch, the sports fish, uh, striped bass, bluefish, fluke, flounder. Uh, they're very necessary. And, uh, it, this is a food species, it's a forage fish. And uh, it, it brings a lot to the table when it comes to restoration. So alewives became, a, just in terms of 9-11, just go back there for a second. You're an operating engineer. What were you doing at 9-11? Uh, at the time, I, uh, I was burning steel and rigging steel and moving steel out of the way. Uh, when I first got there, I was on a bucket brigade for about six hours. Uh, that was very tiresome work. You, know, you just did it as long as you could, and then uh, you know you had to take a break. But you worked heavy machinery ultimately there. Uh, no, I just worked the torch, burning steel. I burned a tremendous amount of steel. Well, why did you burn steel? We had to cut it to get it out of the way to to dig deeper into the pile to look for rest. You know, to to rescue anyone who might have been alive. But unfortunately, after 24 hours, there was nobody alive. And you were telling me just before we started the show, heading to Penn Station to go home yeah. because trains were still running. And what did you see that was very meaningful to you? Well, I was there for three days straight. And uh, there was no real difference between night and day because it was just so dark. So as I walked up and I was done working down there, uh, I looked over my shoulder to see a dark black cloud. And I realized that was the, I was working under that. And that's why uh, I didn't realize that the sun was out. But that black cloud uh, is still over my shoulder. And uh, I wanted to save life. And uh, I wasn't able to do it there. So about 10 years later, I uh, came across the fish alewife. Uh, I didn't find that fish. That fish found me. And I, I couldn't get it out of my mind. How I, did the fish find you? Uh, it kind of popped out of the water and landed on the ground right next to my feet. Where was this? This was at Sunken Meadow State Park uh, at a earthen dam that was built by Robert Moses back in 1950. For whatever reason, no one really knows. But it was a tidal river that was dammed up. And uh, me and my family, we would hike along that area and we would stop there and, and enjoy the view. And uh, I, I grabbed this fish that had landed outside the water, uh, waterfall, so to say, and uh, I picked it up, I got a good look at it, and I threw him where he wanted to go, and he, he swam away, and I, uh, I could never get it out of my, my mind. I was interested in helping this fish out. I could see how hard of a time it was having. And uh, I started making phone calls, and uh, finally someone from the DEC got back to me, and we were very excited that I had found this fish, and there was an open study for it for three years, and it was the last month of uh, this study about this fish to see if it was there. And uh, they wanted to see if I could find it again. So I, uh, as a fisherman, a recreational fisherman, I uh, considered it a, a challenge. And uh, the more I found out about this fish, uh, the more amazing it was. And one of the unfortunate things about this fish is its numbers are down by 90 to 100 percent, depending on which river. So uh, there was something for me to save. And uh, you know, I can't do it by myself, but. You know, me documenting them to prove that they're still existing uh, is, uh, opens the door for federal funding, state funding, to uh, help this fish. It's a, it's a species of concern, which means it's uh, not endangered, but that would be the next step. Downgrading is uh, endangered and then extinct. So, uh, yeah, the only state in the New England area, including New York, that has a the ability to harvest these fish is Maine, because they could show a sustainable fishery where all the other New England states no longer can. Now, how did you get from saving alewives to saving 
aquatic vegetation? Well, uh, I, I was a landscaper when I was a kid. I cut a lot of grass. And uh, we got a lot of machines that, that plant grass, cut grass. We got pesticides and herbicides to keep it perfect. <laughs> uh, but I did a, a, a restoration of Spartina grass, which is a seagrass that grows along the shorelines in brackish water near shore. You did the restoration for who? Save the Sound. Uh, and then a year later, I did it again with them. Save the Sound is an environmental organization. Yeah, and mostly in Connecticut, but they're Connecticut, New York funded right. uh, organization. Uh, and they asked me, you know, what I thought about it. I told them I, I really didn't like it because it was very slow and effective and damaging. And uh, How were they doing it? How were they trying to? They were just planting shoots that were grown in a nursery about a foot tall. And we were digging holes, putting a little fertilizer into the ground in the wetland, which is a no-no. Putting these in there. And the, and the whole time we were trampling on everything else, the crabs, uh, the existing vegetation. I was in over my knees in mud. I was getting bit by bugs. And I didn't like it. I thought it was, uh, it wasn't good enough. And it had to be a better way. To plant. Yeah, so I, I, I started doing research on it. I was challenged by Save the Sound. They said, if you could think of a better way to do this, we're all for it. So I, uh, I started doing the research on it like I did with Alewife. And what I found is that it's in jeopardy and we're losing worldwide eelgrass, which is a, a completely submerged aquatic vegetation. We're losing about 7% a year worldwide. So it's calculable to see that it's all going to be gone. Well, it's Spartina was the first that you work with, right? Correct. And you <coughs> figured out a better way to plant Spartina grass? Not specifically Spartina, but eelgrass. Oh, so which you, you, is you jump from the Spartina to eelgrass then? Yeah, they're very similar, where they both grow in a marine environment, saltwater environment. Uh, but when it came to eelgrass, it was... Uh, it was a challenge, and uh, I thought it absurd that here on Long Island, we will have all these green lawns, and everybody knows how to grow one of them, and it's actually fairly easy, and there's all sorts of machines to do it. But when it comes to growing eelgrass in the ocean, is there is no machine that does that. Eelgrass in the ocean, or the bays. Or the bay, or the, the you know, shallow uh, sea coast. Uh, it's it's uh, th it's uh, astounding to me that no one's ever figured out how to do that. Right. And Jacques Cousteau was a big hero of mine growing up as a kid. He was sure. one channel I liked to watch. <laughs> uh, and he said that man's never been able to farm the sea. And 40 years later, I think I figured out a way to do it. Like how? I, uh, I did a lot of research on, there's been about 12 machines made that are all complete and other failures. Uh, but me, I, I thought differently. I thought there's got to be another way to do this, uh, some other means. And knowing that clams bury themselves and that these seeds to grow need to be buried, I thought maybe if I manipulated the situation by attaching seeds to clams and the clams could bury the seeds, that would work. That's the eelgrass seeds. You'd attach it to clams. The clams would go into the, into the ground, and boom, you'd have eelgrass sprouting up, no? That's exactly what I've been doing. And, uh, I'm in my third year running trials on it. I've been very successful. I haven't failed yet. Uh, but when it comes to the clam, just, it doesn't just bury the seed. The clams have a, a symbiotic relationship with eelgrass. Uh, the excrement from the clam is nitrogen for the plant to grow. The clam also filters out a lot of particulates in the, in the water column, allowing more sunlight to come through. The plant desperately needs. And in return, the plant produces oxygen, which the clam desperately needs. So they have this relationship, and I figured to, to spend my time trying to figure out what works in nature and then how to manipulate that instead of trying to reinvent the wheel what works already? What's well, taken millions of years to develop? How that works, the secrets behind that. And like I said, uh, you know, just tweaking it a little bit and enhancing it. Because uh, transplanting eelgrass from one donor bed to another per acre is about a million dollars. Oh. It's very expensive. It's uh, very time consuming and it's 
it's not very successful. So it's not really generally done. And then there's another method where they collect seeds. It's called broadcast seeding. They collect seeds and they throw them out. But it's not very effective. It works, but it's also very hard to uh, determine how well it works because these seeds move around with the currents, wave action, and uh, there's a lot of predators that eat these seeds like crabs, snails, slugs, fish. So it's not very effective. So my means is a, is a third way, a, a possible way to do it on a massive scale. Now, how, how do you, well, you can't use glue. How, how do you connect the seed to the clam? How do, how do, you, how do you make a connection, a firm connection? I, I do use a glue. You do glue glue. Yeah, there's, a, there's about 5,000 adhesives in, in use in the United States. <laughs> it, it took about a month to figure out to use a good one, but the one I use is used in aquariums, and it's, uh, it's biodegradable and it's not toxic. Oh, really? And it works in wet conditions. It's, uh, it's perfect. Is there a trade name for this? Uh? Uh, cryanoacrylate. It's uh, crazy glue. Crazy glue? Uh, that's, it. that's what crazy glue is. And, uh, and, and it's not toxic? Well, there are some forms of that glue that are kind of toxic, but there's others that are pure. They use them for band-aids and uh, for field dressing in, in the military. They actually have a spray. If you got a big cut, you could spray it and glue your skin right back on. <laughs> uh, and they also use it for heart patients. Uh, people that have surgery, uh, sometimes they are diabetics and uh, sutures cause infections. So by using a, a, a glue, you don't need those sutures and you prevent infection. But, but if you have a seed and you have a clam, you use the glue, that's time consuming to glue all those seeds onto s all those clams, no? Uh, it is, but it's actually, I, I, I could do it pretty quick. Once, once you come up with a system to do it, uh, but my, my goal is to have an automated machine that does so. Ah. Now, have you, you've been involved uh, with Cornell Cooperative Extension, with uh, uh, who else in terms of your, your, your concept? Uh, pretty much just Cornell for now, but I, I am gonna be working with two other institutions uh, to try and prove or disprove my innovation. Uh, hopefully it's proved. That Stony Brook Marine Science? Uh, St Stony Brook, uh, Chris Goldler, <coughs> Brad Peterson, and then uh, the other institution would be uh, VIMS, Virginia Institute of Marine Science, uh, Robert Orth. And with Cornell, I work with uh, Chris Pickerel and Stephen Schott. And, and, and do all these folks think that there's promise here in this? Well, Cornell does. They let me use their labs to do whatever I want to do and run my own experiments. Really, huh? Yeah, and, and it's, it's working out pretty good. I can't afford myself to have these labs. So uh, I'm very thankful to be able to use them. You know, Cornell Cooperative Extension has been so important, whether it's to the farming industry on Long Island or whether it's to the marine environment. They have all, uh, all, all kinds of other programs, well, too. Cornell was instrumental in bringing back bay scallops to Peconic Bay. Uh, they were pretty much wiped out from the brown tides. Uh, when it comes to bay scallops, they only have like a two-year life cycle. So if you have two bad years of water quality in a row, they're gone. They're just gone, but they could reintroduce them. But my, my focus is on eelgrass, which is the foundation of the marine environment in the shallow sea. Uh, it's the common denominator of all fish species, crustaceans, diatoms, bacteria, algae. Uh, they all relate with eelgrass. Uh, eelgrass is a, is a nursery ground for uh, juvenile fish. It's a place for protection for them from predators. And it's also a place for predators to come feed. And it produces oxygen. But there's, a, you know, there's five major things that eelgrass does that are, are beneficial to uh, a healthy environment. And uh, one is that it's habitat for about 80% of all fish that live in the sea. At one time or another in their life cycle, they're in and around eelgrass beds. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, two, it, it produces oxygen, which... Uh, we know in the Conic Bay we have low oxygen levels. It was uh, one of the reasons cited for uh, the Conic Bay scallop die-off. Uh, a third thing it does is it, it slows down erosion by building up, it traps sediment that's suspended in the water column. It traps it and it kind of settles down so it builds up the shoreline and it also slows down wave action. So it's, it's one of the, the, you know, it's the best natural buffer for erosion that we could utilize. Uh, 
uh, better than using hard shorelines or uh, bulkheads. Uh, another amazing thing about eelgrass is that it, it sequesters carbon from the atmosphere that you know, falls down from uh, the sky into the water. It sequesters carbon 30 times more than a rainforest per square meter per square acre, which is uh, pretty much new information. Only in the last couple of years, they've, scientists have figured this out. And, uh, although eelgrass only takes up 0.01 or 0.02% of the seafloor worldwide, it's responsible for, for storing about 15% of the carbon that lands in the ocean. And another thing that it does, eelgrass, is that uh, it neutralizes the effects of ocean acidification, which comes from carbon. When carbon lands into the salt water, it, it produces carbonic acid, which uh, makes the water more acidic. Now, if you have acidic water, uh, baby spat shells from uh, clams, mussels, oysters, they dissolve. Where an adult could withstand it, uh, the babies can't. So as we lose our eelgrass, we're losing our scallops, and we're losing our clams, and we're losing our oysters. So it's, a, it's the most beneficial foundational species we could work on to restore worldwide. Well, you're so not, I mean, Stony Brook should give you a, a graduate degree in marine science tomorrow. I mean, you're really into it. You know it, you know this issue. Well, I, some people say I'm very passionate about it. I have my heart in it, and I do, because I want to be successful. I want to succeed. But I don't want to succeed for me. It's, it's not personal about me. It's about saving something that I'm watching slowly disappear, slowly getting destroyed, slowly vanishing. But it's, it's going. And uh, kind of like when you're riding a horse, you pull back those reins to slow them down. That's what I'm trying to do. With a better idea. I mean, that's your vision here. Well, it's innovation that got us into the mess of bad water quality. It's innovation that's going to get us out of this mess. Innovation how got us into the mess? Well, uh, the innovation of a septic system on a house. So you could live in a house and have a toilet bowl and just flush it down. It goes down. That's an innovation. Uh, you know, so that's an innovation. But what they didn't know is that the nitrogen that becomes part of the water molecule and it travels through the sand and it goes to the nearest body of water. It could take 50, 100 years or just one year to get to the nearest bay, but it's going to get there, where uh, the sand around a cesspool might trap a lot of the heavy metals and toxins. It does not stop the nitrogen. And what happens when you have an overabundance of nitrogen in the water column, you get algae blooms, harmful algae blooms, HABs, and they, they kill. Uh, they kill all the wildlife. They sucks up all the oxygen. So that's pretty much everything. So that's been a, the big reason why we had a collapse of bay scallops, hard clams, and oysters, is lack of oxygen. I remember in, what was it, 85 when brown tide first hit yeah, the East I End Bays, right. and they spoke about then, the marine scientists, the brown tide cutting back sunlight to eelgrass, and that was a key reason for the uh, uh, well, for the destruction of so much eelgrass, they just didn't get sunlight. That's true. Uh, it needs sunlight to ha create photosynthesis, which all plants use. Uh, so if there's no sunlight getting to it, uh, it's going to die. Uh, another thing we do here on Long Island and many other states is they spray for mosquito control. They spray this chemical that's... Uh, Methoprene. Methoprene here on Long Island. And other states they use other chemicals. But uh, methoprene here on Long Island kills indiscriminately. It's meant to kill the larval stage of mosquitoes. And it does. Not very effectively, but it does. But it also indiscriminately kills many other organisms, insects, animals, such as amphibians, invertebrates, freshwater fish. It bioaccumulates in saltwater fish but it also kills the grazers of the eelgrass. On eelgrass blades, there's little snails and slugs that go up and down the blades, and they actually eat the, the algae that, that uh, accrues on them. So when they eat that algae, now the sunlight can get to the plant. If we're killing off those grazers, the algae is going to build up on the eelgrass. It's going to wilt and die. And that's a big problem. 
We spend millions of dollars on methoprene now. Last I checked, it was about $24 million they spent since 2009. Since Suffolk they, County. Since they started resuming. If they uh, told everyone to go buy your own bug spray and they stopped, it would, it would greatly benefit eelgrass, which is the foundation of all species that live in our base. Seems to me, though, that water clarity has to kind of work in partnership with your vision of how you can more efficiently grow eelgrass, because if you don't have that clarity, well, <coughs> unfortunately, there's places that they did eelgrass restoration and it failed, and it shouldn't have failed. They didn't know why it failed, but they found that the conditions had changed. Where a place used to have eelgrass and it disappeared, they tried replanting it there, and it grew for a, a, a period of time, but it died because the conditions had changed. Uh, the sulfide uh, in the soil is not conducive to grow eelgrass, and it will just die. Or there's uh, nitrogen loading from land-based sources uh, and sewage treatment plants that cause the algae blooms that stop the sunlight, and uh, it won't grow there. But there are other places that they do know that it will grow, and there's just not really a, a, a funded means to, to do it. There's no real eelgrass planting program here in New York. In Chesapeake Bay, uh, they have a great restoration, the best restoration of eelgrass in the world. Mm. Uh, it took them 20 years to grow 400 acres, but those 400 acres blossomed to 10,000 acres. Mm. And now they're looking at bringing back bay scallops, which they lost when they lost their eelgrass. Wow. Well, we're out of time, but I hope we're <laughs> not out of eelgrass. And I think, frankly, your concept is, uh, just seems to me to be a, a potential breakthrough, a possible breakthrough. Rob Vazaluth, uh, an operating engineer with a strong environmental interest and a commitment. And he's very much focused on what's so needed, restoring eelgrass. You've been watching Environment Long Island. I'm Carl Grossman. Thanks for tuning in. Thank <laughs> you.